If you have a Bible, head on over to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 this morning. We're almost going to make it through the first chapter of Philippians this morning. We're going to be in uh, verses 12 through 26. And so I believe it's, it's good for us to go kind of slow throughout this first chapter of Philippians. We've, if you're new, we've entitled this series, uh, as we journey through the book of Philippians, we've entitled this series, Finding Joy Right Where You Are. Finding Joy Right Where You Are. And we're uh, looking at how Paul lived this life of joy. And if you're like me, there have been seasons in your life where you could use a little joy. You could use a little encouragement in your life. And uh, even this week, it was a little bit more of a stressful week uh, for me. And uh, there were some days where it was hard to find joy in the moment. Uh, and so uh, even last yesterday, I, I, a Friday night, Aislinn uh, put on some Ch- a Carmex chapstick, and I guess she's allergic to it because uh, her lips just uh, went huge. Like something was happening, something was not right. Uh, and so uh, I'm kind of a hypochondriac, if that's the right word, with my kids, especially if I don't know. Like if they hurt their arm, you can kind of tell, but their lips, like is, the, is this swelling going to go to her throat? Is she going to die today? Like uh, I didn't really know. It was late at night. It was already 9 30, 10 o'clock. We just had gotten home from somebody's house. And I remember uh, I, I, the whole night really I couldn't sleep because I con- constantly, I slept on her floor for a little while because I, I was scared, honestly, and it was hard to find joy in that moment. And then, uh, then that, that morning at 3.30 a.m., for some reason, Kevin Shaw uh, convinced me to get up with him and go downtown to help run this event. And we had a great time doing that. But then I got home and all of a sudden I got a migraine and I was planning on like studying and getting stuff done. I got a migraine. I was like, oh, woe is me. Like, why does this, why does this have to happen? Happen and it was hard. Even this weekend, as I studied all week to preach a message about joy, it was hard to find joy uh, in some moments. And there was times whenever I had to uh, really focus in. Even this morning, I had to pray, Lord, it's got to be you this morning. It can't be me this morning. I, I didn't prepare as often as, as well as I did and take Saturday because I was stuck in bed all day. And so there are seasons when we need to, this reminder of living a life of, of joy finding joy right where you are, even when it is difficult to do. Last week, we talked to the essence of this unique bond that was between Paul and Philippi. And uh, we've talked to the essence of this was a unique bond because they were, first of all, they were partnering together for the gospel. If you remember that, they were partnering together for the gospel. Uh, We talked about how they are vessels for the voice of the gospel. And then we talked how they are partakers in the gospel. And all these things accumulated to a life uh, of a unique bond pushing for this word that we use, the furtherance of the gospel. And so uh, we're going to continue to see this, this week how, how Paul really lived a life of joy because he lived a life centered upon God's word, because he lived a life centered around God. He, his, his main focus was to live a life in pursuit for God, and, and that, that echoes all throughout his life. You know, when you look at Paul's writings, it's unequivocal that Paul had this passion to preach in Rome. He desperately wanted to preach in Rome. When you look at some of his writings, he'll pretty much tell you that, hey, I know if the Lord will move me to Rome, it'll change some things. The gospel will expand to thousands upon thousands of people if I can get to Rome. He says in Acts 19, Uh, Verse 21, after I've been there, he's talking about Jerusalem, I must also go to Rome. He had this passion to go to Rome, to preach the gospel. Uh, Romans 1 will tell us this, as so much as in me, I'm eager, meaning I'm ready to go preach the gospel. And not just preach the gospel, that was a passion of his, but to preach the gospel to a certain spot, Rome. He wanted to go to Rome, and so uh, we've seen how God has delivered Paul to Rome, but he's not not, uh, there in the way in which he's expected because he's not preaching in synagogues and religious centers. He's he's in a prison. He's under house arrest, and we've seen that uh, already two years in a jail in Caesarea, three months shipwrecked in Malta, and now here he is under house arrest. This is where Paul's at, and Paul had a heart 
to go preach here, but he is in prison. We've seen this word furtherance of the gospel. We noted this last week. This word simply means this furtherance of the gospel. I want you to notice this word again this morning because this really shaped his character. This word furtherance of the gospel. Furtherance will mean a purposeful advancement. It's advancing despite obstacles. It's advancing despite obstacles. It's a Greek military term that was used whenever uh, the army military, the army engineers, they would go before the army and they would clear the land. They, They would clear the land. They would tear down trees. They would make a way for the army to get through. And so Paul was joyful in every circumstances that he faced because he viewed his life in that way. I'm paving the way. I'm paving the way not for myself, not for people to follow me, but I'm paving a way for the gospel to advance through my life. And it was life changing. We see this life of joy. And so this morning, I want you to notice that even in struggle, Paul will remain joyful because the gospel advances through him. It's all about the furtherance of the gospel. Let's pray and then we'll dive into verses 12 through 26. Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for... Uh, the ability just to uh, sing your praises and sing worship to you. Lord, I pray that uh, as we uh, unpack the book of Philippians, Lord, I pray that you'll move uh, in our midst. Lord, I pray that you'll uh, guide and direct my words. Lord, I pray that you will work in this place. Lord, I pray that if someone is here and they don't uh, know you, Lord, they don't have the joy in the Lord because they don't know Jesus. Lord, I pray that today will be the day. I pray that if there's those in this room that are struggling to find joy, may they find it as Paul did, no matter what, in a life lived uh, pursuing you and finding joy right where we are. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The first thing I want you to notice is in verse 12 through 14, it's this. Paul's chains showed his commitment to make Christ known. Paul's chains showed his commitment to make Christ known. Verse 12 says it this way, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it's become evident to the whole palace guard and all the rest that my chains are in Christ and most of the brethren in the Lord, having become more confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. What what a passage. What an impactful couple of scriptures. You know, I pray that 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 will be said about my life one day. That, that my testimony will be one that, that advances the gospel of Jesus. I pray that that's your heart too. That, that because of the testimony of how God has worked in us, it's become evident to those around us that the gospel is working through us and in us and all around us and is shaping who we are. Paul's chains became, caused it to become evident that Jesus Christ was known. Paul's chains showed his commitment to make Jesus known. You know, they say that prison is a place where dreams go to die, but here Paul finds joy. I think it's interesting because Paul still has no clue what's going to take place in his life. Paul doesn't know. He's sitting under house arrest and he has no clue when he's getting released, when he's dying. He doesn't know. And yet he finds joy. He's physically bound. His ministry is very restricted. The leader is Nero, who is an extremely wicked guy, and yet he lives this life of joy because his chain served as an advancement to the gospel. His chain served to continue to work. And I find this interesting because the reality is Paul's either crazy, uh, he's lying, or he's onto something. Those are your options. Paul's either crazy, like, yeah, right, what are you talking about? He's either lying, like, okay, bro, calm down. Or, or he's on to something here because how can he be joyful in these moments? Because he understood what the furtherance of the gospel meant. Uh, I'm, I'm paving the way. I'm, I'm causing people uh, to continue. It's becoming evident to all those around me that I follow Jesus and so can they. And so uh, I live this life of joy because although I have chains, my commitment to Jesus says this, hey, Christ is known through my life. I wonder if that would be said of us this morning, that we have this passion to make Christ known throughout uh, our lives. This commitment really shows us that Paul is spiritually mature. So maybe I can ask you this way, uh, are you spiritually mature? What uh, What type of chains does it take in your life to cause you to diminish your commitment that you've made to God? 
They say that spiritual maturity can often be weighed by what it takes to steal your joy. Spiritual maturity can often be weighed by what it takes to steal your joy. So let me ask you this way. What does it take to steal your joy? What does it take to steal the joy of the Lord in your life? For Paul, nothing could steal the joy of the Lord because the joy of the Lord was everything to him. But what about you? Does it just take frustrations at work, frustrations at home, and balance in the home? Does it just uh, take a slow driver in front of you on the way to church this morning? Well, what's it take to steal the joy in the Lord that's in your life? Paul was spiritually mature. His chains showed his commitment to make Jesus known. These, uh, this commitment is shown in a few ways. Uh, first of all, it's shown that he has a passion for God. It says here, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. As Paul understood that, that the same God who uses Moses' rod and used Gideon's pitchers is the same God that used David's sling, is the same God that's going to use the chains that are in his life, and it's the same God who, who can use what you face too. It's all about his passion. He had a passion for God. Second Timothy will actually tell us this. If you want to write it down, Second Timothy 2.9 says this, For which a cause I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But, it says, but the word of God is not chained. I may suffer even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. He had this passion for God. Paul may have been chained, but he knew the gospel could not be contained. And so he rejoiced. So he had this commitment that said, no matter what takes place in my life, the biggest commitment that I'm going to hold to is I'm going to make Jesus known with my life. And so do we. Do we have this desire to make Jesus known? We said it last week. His perspective was, hey, I want to be a vessel for the voice of the gospel. The gospel that changed my life, I now want to flow through my life. And, and do we? Do we have that same passion to allow the chains to not diminish the commitment that we have for God, but to increase the commitment that we have to God to make Christ known through our good and through what we perceive to be our chains? Do we have that Passion. Paul's passion can be summarized in Romans 1.15. We've already read it. He says this, as much as is in me, he says with everything in me, I am eager, meaning I'm ready. I'm looking forward. I can't wait to preach the gospel. I can't wait. Everything about me, I want to preach Jesus. I want to make Jesus known. But he goes specific to Rome too. To Rome also, I, I want to go there and I want to preach there. He had this passion, sorry, I don't really know what that was. He had this passion for God. So much so whenever you look in, in all of Paul's writings, you'll notice that the gospel is, is talked about 72 times. It was, tr it was a true passion that Paul had to preach Jesus, to make Jesus known. William Booth, who, if you don't know William Booth, he was the one who started the Salvation Army and he once said this, he says, um, some man's passions for gold, some man's passions for art, some man's passion is for fame, but mine is for souls. And so what's your passion this morning? What passions do you have? The second thing we see is that he also had a passion for God, but he also had a passion to preach. It says this, it became evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. I'm going to have to grab a mic. on. I got the blue mic. We've been having problems with these mics. It's okay. The Lord knows. He had a passion to preach. Look what the verse says. It became evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. It became evident. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Remember the word furtherance, right? Uh, despite obstacles, this desire to further the gospel, a purposeful advancement. That was his passion. He had a passion to preach the gospel. What's he essentially saying? He's saying to Philippi this, hey, don't worry about me. Don't, don't worry about anything that I've gone through, uh, the chains, the beatings, all the above. He, I'm not worried about it. You don't be worried about it because it's actually helped pave the way. It's actually uh, helped uh, show others Jesus. 
He had a passion to preach the gospel, and he shows us that in three unique ways. He says Jesus was preached to the palace guards. This was the elite imperial soldiers of the palace. This would kind of be like, hey, if, if the, uh, you were bound to the secret service today, somebody who you would view as unreachable. I don't know anybody in the secret service. Doubt you do, uh, maybe. But uh, someone who we would be like, ah, they're probably not coming to my church. This is who was bound to Paul. Uh, so much so that six hours a day, 24 hours a day, uh, one of these imperial soldiers would be bound to Paul. They would be locked to Paul for six hours a day, 24-7. Six hours, six, six hour shifts. And it makes me wonder that maybe the best way for the gospel to advance in Rome was not the religious center in which Paul was used to preaching, but it was actually the prison. Why? Because, because the Bible says, I love the context of the Bible, because it says this. It says it became evident to the whole palace guard. It didn't become evident for, for just a couple of the palace guard. It became evident to the whole palace guard. It was said that there were about 10,000 imperial soldiers that would have been uh, referring to these men. 10,000. It says it became evident to the whole palace guard. That, that Jesus was preached, that Jesus was made known. It doesn't say that they all received Christ. Later in scriptures, it will say that some received Christ because of Paul's example. But what's he say? Jesus was preached here. It's become evident to the whole palace guard that Jesus was actually preached. And I love that because God has a purpose for even our chains, for even our su- God had a purpose for Paul's chains, and oftentimes he has a purpose for your struggles too. That what we may view as un, unattainable, or what, what we may view as, hey, there's no coming back for this, that may be the very thing that God wants to use to point to his glory. And so there's this desire to, hey, let's commit to that. Let, let's stay fixed and focused on that commitment. To the whole palace guard, secondly, we see this, Jesus was preached to all the rest. This is all the rest. That, that word implies uh, meaning the Roman citizens. That Paul was under house arrest, meaning he could not go out to Rome, but under house arrest meant that anybody could come in. If you look at Acts, in Acts I believe it's 28, he'll talk about that many people would come into uh, Paul's house arrest and hear from Paul and, pre, and, and hear the gospel. Uh, Jewish leaders, Roman leaders, all the above, Roman citizens, they would come into the house and they would hear Jesus preach through Paul's chains, all the rest. And then he says this, the brethren in the Lord. What were the brethren in the Lord? They were bold to preach the gospel because of Paul's chains because of his commitment to endure, to make Christ known no matter what takes place in his life. It says all the brethren, that his chains helped others speak with confidence and boldness, that, that, they, they, that helped them make, have a desire to make Jesus known with their life. The brethren that are in the Lord. A few weeks ago I was golfing with a member of this church, and we were going on an outing, and we were just having some uh, fun. It was uh, an older group of, of people, and, and we were just there. And I, so I, I was uh, alone, and so I was with them, but he already had a partner, and so he got partnered, and, and I was partnered with somebody else, but we were in the same group. It, it's called the, a foursome if you never golfed. Four carts go together. And so we're all there. We're standing on the first tee, and uh, the guy who I'm partnered with says, hey, there, there was just a death uh, from a friend. A friend just, just died, and we started talking about it, and, and we started to, you know, give our condolences, and, hey, we're going to pray for that. Hey, we're praying for them. Um, you know, we're thinking of you. But then, honestly, we got on the tee. We were already on there just waiting, and, and we hit, and uh, he and I, we jumped in the car, and we just started talking about our hits and, and just carrying it on, and uh, maybe it would come back up, but I really didn't think much of it. And, and I was, I, you know, I was moved because this, this guy from our church, he came up to our car and, said, and, and, and stopped and said, hey, I I think let's pray. Uh, I want to pray. I want to pray for this family. I want to pray for comfort. I want to pray for you. That's your friend. And and right there on on the whole one, uh, middle of the course, we stopped and we prayed uh, for this person. And and I wasn't in fear, uh, but it it reminded me that I need to be more sincere. I need to have uh, better motives and better perspectives sometimes. And honestly, I became a better follower of Jesus because of that example that was in my life. Even this week, I've tried to apply that even more. And that's what Paul's chains did. 
Why? Because Paul was rich and prosperous? No, because he had a desire to make Jesus known, and it caused other people to want to make Jesus known too. Secondly, I want you to notice this. Paul's crisis calls Christ to be preached. Paul's chains cause his commitment to make Christ known. But secondly, Paul's critics, rather, cause Christ to be preached. Look at verse 15. It says this. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I'm appointed uh, for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Honestly, for me, it's hard to believe that people would be in opposition with Paul. I look at Paul and I'm like, man, I want to know that guy. And yet there's many believers in Rome who were living in opposition with this guy. That, that in the Bible, they're actually the people of God were actually divided. And I know that sounds so bizarre to us, right? And I, no, sadly, it, beca- it sounds all too familiar. He says, hey, there's some pre- people preaching in goodwill. There's some people preaching in love. But there's others who are preaching uh, the right message but with the wrong methods. There's others who are preaching uh, opposition to me that are causing problems to me. And we don't really know whether uh, they just didn't like Paul's overemphasis. I shouldn't say overemphasis. Paul's emphasis in grace and not the Jewish law or Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. But we do know these people felt a rivalry with Paul. And so they caused problems in Paul's life. And he'll note four oppositions that are found in your, script, in your scriptures. It says there's envy, there's strife, there's selfish ambitions, uh, and there is affliction. We see this. You know, I read a, uh, sadly, we see this oftentimes in our churches too. We see this all throughout our lives where people of God will divide over uh, second tier issues and they'll cause, uh, they'll divide over uh, things that shouldn't be necessities of the faith and we we live in division. I heard a joke this week that said, how many Christians does it take to uh, install a light bulb? And I, and I just, uh, just, Let's be blunt, this is a joke. So if this is any of your background, I'm going to try to offend every denomination in this two-minute section of my sermon, okay? Uh, (laughs) It said this, uh, how many Christians does it take to change a light bulb? Presbyterians said none. Lights go on and off at predestined times. Catholics said none, candles only. (laughs) Southern Baptists said 15, one to change it and three committees to approve the change. Independent Baptist said three, one to change it, one to order food, and one to talk about how much better the old bulb was. Charismatic said one, hands are already in the air. Pentecostal said ten, one to change it, and nine to pray against the spirit of darkness. Unitarian said this, we choose not to make a statement about the need for changing a light bulb, but if you see fit that applies for your life, then we think that's fine. Nazarene says, one woman to replace the light bulb while five men sit and review the light policy. (laughs) Lutheran said, none. We don't believe in change. And Amish said, what is a light bulb? (laughs) Of course, I'm joking, but so often that's true. We we live divided as God's people. And here, uh, Paul was, Paul felt that there was people that were living divided. They were declaring a good message, but they had the wrong motives. That's why we'll say here in our intro to village class, that hey, this may not be the right church for you. And that's okay. Like uh, We believe that God's working here. We believe that God wants to do great things here. But if that's not true for you, and if you don't feel that, then, then uh, we don't want to force it. We want you to find the place where God wants you to be and where you can grow and where you can have community. And, and we want to help you do that. We want to do this thing called life together. But here he defines, he says they're preaching the right message but they're causing great opposition to my life. They're, they're, effect, they're causing affliction upon me. He says this, that there was envy, meaning they were jealous. Uh, they were uh, causing problems. Uh, multiple times, Paul's already said throughout his writings that this is not me. This is God through me. Uh, I am nothing without Christ. This is all work from God, but yet there was envy. There was jealousy. 
The second word that he defines is strife. They were contentious. They were quick to cause uh, problems in the life of Paul and and, uh, preach the right message but go about it the wrong way. There was selfish ambition. Your Bible may say there was was, uh, contention or faction. This word was used for when somebody was canvassing for office, uh, their, their main priority in their canvassing for office would be to, uh, to kind of uh, disregard and, and make fun of and cause problems uh, to the other candidate. Like they would do it the wrong way. They wouldn't preach what they're for. They would preach uh, why the other one is bad. This was the same word. There's selfish ambitions. This is all for my glory, uh, not for the greater good. This is to put down others. So in a way, they were slamming Paul in his ministry because they were trying to uh, make something of their own, which caused affliction was the fourth one that he says. It caused great affliction in his life. You could say it this way. They, they were malicious. They caused great problems. They were wanting to add a chaos to the life of Paul. But notice, these critics were not anti-Christ. They were just anti-Paul. And so what's Paul do? He says, let's stand against them. No, he says, I rejoice because Jesus has preached. Although they may add affliction to my life, although they may, they may uh, not approve of me, I approve of their message because Jesus is magnified, because Jesus is preached. And so uh, Jesus is preached. And so I rejoice. And here's the thing, we should too. When Jesus is preached, we should, we should rejoice. The reality is there, uh, none of us uh, share the same uh, per- per- perspective on everything. Even in this room, there, there are probably people who I would disagree with on some areas. We would disagree about some things. There, there are some uh, people who would prefer one version of the Bible uh, uh, before another. There are some people who have different uh, music flavors in the room, but we can still have unity in Jesus. We can still have unity that Jesus is preached, and we should. The reality is if you came to church, you came up to me after the service and said, hey, I don't like you, I'm leaving the church, bye. I may, you, may, you may find me in the corner crying a little bit, but the reality is that, that, that that's fine. And if you called me that this week and said, hey, do you know any good churches in the area? <laughs> I would be like, I would help you find one. Why? Because it's my job? No, because that's the purpose. Christ, as long as Christ is preached, I rejoice, and we should too. Paul gives us that sense. The truth is, Paul realized that the power is the message, not the messenger. The power is the message, not the messenger. Notice what he says in verse 16. I'm put here for the defense of the gospel, that I'm here. That word put here is the word that means appointed. And Paul says, hey, whether my chains or whether my critics, it's appointed for me, and so I can rejoice as long as Christ is preached, I rejoice. Sure, we stand against people who don't preach Christ, but if Christ is preached, I rejoice, and so should we. Paul shows the church of Philippi in this text. This is essentially what he shows them, a bunch of words that say this. Hey, God can take any circumstances, what we would view as good or what we would view as bad, and turn them for good as long as Christ is preached, uh, he is magnified, and we can rejoice. So what's the application for us? In pretense and his truth, in pretense and in truth, Christ is preached. Paul didn't let the baggage of conflict conflict the message of Jesus going forth. And that is extremely difficult for us to do too. Because there, there are differences in the room, but there can be unity in Jesus being preached. And Paul shows us that essence. Paul's in prison, but his focus is on loving Philippi. His focus is on helping Philippi. And his focus is on preaching the gospel to Rome. That's his focus. So uh, what's your focus? The third thing is this. Paul's crisis calls Christ to be magnified. Paul's chains, Paul's critics, and Paul's crisis. Paul's crisis calls Christ to be magnified. Notice verse 19, it says this. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He says, for I know, I got this, I know this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and for the supply and the Spirit of Jesus Christ. It's very possible We'll hit on this a little bit uh, later uh, next week or I think the week after that. It's very possible that Paul could die in these moments. He has no clue. It's very possible that Paul could uh, be found a traitor and executed in Rome. And yet he says, hey, I know. 
I know that if God delivers me or because the people of Philippi prayed and the Spirit of God wants me to remain here for the furtherance of the gospel, I know that. I've got that locked down. He says the word supply. The word supply can be broken down to mean to provide grace, generously and lavishly. To, to provide generously and lavishly. What he's saying, some people will say that Paul was saying that he knows that he's going to be uh, free. He, he knows that he's going to be saved. He knows that he's going to free uh, be free from prison. Verse 20 will say, whether in death or life or death. And so uh, we don't really know uh, what he's talking about, but we do know this. He says, hey, I know that God will supply and it'll be lavishly generous. Whether I, I get free from prison, that's lavishly generous of God. Or whether I go to heaven, that's lavishly generous of God too. This is a God will supply. God knows exactly what I mean. And then he says the word deliverance. The word delivered is the same word used for salvation. What does he say? God is going to deliver me. So I have joy. Whether God's going to save me from prison or whether God's going to send me to heaven, there's joy. Because through Paul's crisis, it caused Christ to be magnified through his life. And here's what Paul understood. The hand of God will never lead him where the grace of God cannot keep him. The hand of God will never lead him where the grace of God cannot keep him. And so he found joy because he knew God was going to supply just what he needed and God was going to deliver him where God wanted him to be. Whether that be here, free, whether that be in prison, or whether that be in heaven, he rejoiced. And so notice what verse 20 says. Verse 20 says, many have viewed this as kind of Paul's mission statement. If Paul had a mission statement, like many churches have mission statements, this would have been Paul's mission statement. Here, verse 20. As it is my eager expectation and my hope uh, that I will not at all be ashamed, but with the full courage, but with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For uh, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that's part far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account, Philippi. Convinced by this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for the progress and joy and faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because my coming to you Again, through Paul's chains, Christ was known. Through Paul's critics, Christ was preached. And through Paul's crisis, Christ was magnified. And it makes me reflect. Do do my chains make Christ known? Or do do my chains just cause themselves to be known (laughs) over Christ? It makes me reflect. Is my focus above everything else about Jesus being preached? Or do differences live dividing me? And do differences live dividing us? And then is Christ magnified in my life? You could ask the same. Is Christ magnified in your life? Paul saw an eager expectation. That word means he's watching with an outstretched neck. Right? Have you ever noticed something that, uh, have you ever been somewhere where it just puts you on the edge of your seat? You just, you, you, you saw something or you experienced something that locked you in and like everything else was uh, just, nothing else was happening but that mo- thing that was taking place in your life. This Thursday, I'm in a softball league and I was pitching and I pitched a couple pitches in and somebody just cranks one in the outfield and I turned with eager expectation, right, to see if somebody was going to catch it. Like that took my focus. I remember when I had my children, when my wife had my children, but I was in the room. Uh, I remember uh, there uh, looking in eager expectation. Nothing else mattered except for what was taking place there. I remember whenever God called me into ministry, my freshman year of college, when God solidified that, and the the pastor was speaking at a chapel service, and I was sitting there with tears in my eyes with eager expectations, like, sign me up for this. Yes, Lord, yes. I want, I want to be on this team. I want to do this. Eager expectations. Paul's eager expectation was simple. I want to be faithful to Jesus, and I want him to be magnified in my life. 
That was Paul's eager expectation. I want to stay faithful, and I want you to be magnified in everything that I do. It's not, hey, Lord, my eager expectation is to remove the chains, remove the critics, remove the haters. No, it's, Lord, be magnified above all else. And so what does Paul's crisis do? It magnified the Lord. Paul's chains magnified the Lord. Paul's critics magnified the Lord. Paul's crisis magnified the Lord. And so he says this, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That Paul's passion was to preach the word, but he knew his future was to be in the presence of the Lord. So he says, for me to live is Christ. Everything I do in this life is because of you. Everything I do in this life is for you. For me to live this life is Christ. John Eddy said this about this statement, for me to live is Christ. He says that the preaching of Christ is the business of my life. The presence of Christ is the cheer of my life. The image of Christ is the crown of my life. The spirit of Christ is the light of my life. The love of Christ is the power of my life. The will of Christ is the law, is the law of my life. And the glory of Christ is the end of my life. For me to live is Christ. It's, it's everything. Paul says this statement, this life is all the Lord's. It's everything. And it made me wonder this week, if I took my week, what would be said if I put my week in that statement? For me to live is blank and to die is blank. Would it have been for me to live as Christ and to die is gain? Or would it have been for me to live as my job and to, and to lose it would cause great depression? For me to live as friends and to lose them would cause a life of emptiness. For me to live as education and to lose it would cause a whole lot of uncertainty in my life. For me to live is what? And to what die is what? Maybe for, for us to live is Christ. Then he says this, to die is gain. He says, if I lose my life and everything in it, this is what I get. I get Jesus. I get to be in the presence of of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so uh, I will serve him here, but I can't wait to experience his presence there because for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's why he'll say in verse 22, he says this, but uh, if I live on this fl- uh, if I live on in the flesh, that'll mean fruitful labor in my be- on my behalf. The longer I'm here, the more fruit I can grow, the more work I can do for the cause of Christ and for the furtherance of the gospel. Uh, being here, I'm going to work. I'm going to live a life uh, because for me to live is Christ. I'm going to pursue him. I'm going to be fruitful. I'm going to have fruitful ministry. But he says this, yet what shall I choose? I can't tell. He says, I'm hard-pressed between the two. I'm split. I want heaven, but I know I need to be here because I have a desire to depart to be with Jesus, which is far better. That word depart, sorry, I'm giving a lot of explanation this morning, but that word depart means to take down your tent and move. It was a word used in, in military forms when they finished what they were set to do and they moved. And this, this, uh, this idea that the job is done. It was used also in a political term describing a a setting free of a prisoner. Remember verse, uh, the first couple verses, Paul and Timothy were bond servants of Jesus Christ, meaning they voluntarily uh, gave their lives to serve him. Uh, Farmers would use this, and this word was used to unyoke the oxen. And so uh, we, see to de- we see this word depart means to take down your tent, to move on. It's a fascinating word. To depart is to be with Jesus, but to remain is for the furtherance of the gospel. So he concludes with this, verse 24. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. You, you, you picture the unselfish nature of Paul. He says, what I really want is to be with Jesus, but nonetheless, I know that the Lord still has work for me to do here. It wasn't like I, I, I've done a lot of work, time to retire, time to go on, time to live it up a little bit, time to go to some, un, 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 some, some land where they don't know me so I can just kind of hide and just enjoy it. No, 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 I know that here's what's best for me to remain because it's needful for you. Well, how's it needful? Being confident of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you uh, all in your progress in joy and faith that your rejoicing uh, may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Paul says, if I have life in my lungs, here's the message I'm declaring. Jesus is preached. 
Christ is magnified above all else. And he explains that here's what's best. This is what's best for the church of Philippi. And he explains two things. It's best I stay here for your progress. That's the same word for advance or or furtherance. He says it's best that I stay here for your maturity in Christ. And he says the second word for for the joy in faith. That you can learn to to, to have and experience and live the joy of the Lord in your life. And so I know that the Lord wants me to remain so I can make an impact and help you grow and help you have and live a life of joy. Why? He says that the gospel may abound and it may be abundant to you to the glory of God. To the glory of God. Paul shows us that the Christian life should be for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God, and with the people of God. That's what it'll show us. That the, the Christian life should entail that we do things for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God, with the people of God. And so we have to ask ourselves, can we truly be devoted to Christ if we're not devoted to all three? The glory of God, the kingdom of God, with the people of God. Can we truly be devoted? Can we, can we truly live a life of joy in the Lord if we're not devoted to all three? To the glory of God, to the kingdom of God, for, with, with, the, with the people of God. And so, in close, Paul's chains made Christ known. So let me ask you this morning, do you know Christ? Has there been a time when you confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life? The Bible says that you can have joy that's found solely in the Lord. How? Through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And so do you know him? Has there been a moment when you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? I'd love to take a Bible and show you how you can do that after the service. Through Paul's critics, Christ was preached. And so is Christ preached everything to you? Is it, is it comes su- su- supreme? We can have unity in Christ being preached and is Christ magnified in your life. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I, I pray that you will help us to have a perspective and a desire that says, Lord, I just want you to be known. I just want you to be preached. And I just want you to be magnified. We see the evidence of this throughout the the scripture. We see this evidence throughout Paul's life. Lord, may you be known, may you be preached, and may you be magnified in us this week. And Lord, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.